My name is Matt Phillips. I am a member of the Board of Directors of the Free State Project, and I would like to thank everyone for being here this morning. Uh, we're very excited. Um, I am just going to roll right into introducing um, Jason Sorens. Jason Sorens is the gentleman responsible for this crazy idea that he had published in 2001, uh, the idea about the Free State Project. Um, he uh, then went on to get his uh, PhD in political science from Yale. He is now a lecturer here in New Hampshire at Dartmouth University, and he lives uh, up there in Lebanon with his wife and daughter. Uh, without further ado, Jason Soren. Thank you, Matt. This is a great day in the history of human freedom. It sounds grandiose, but I really believe it's true. We are firing the starting gun on a mass migration of freedom lovers to New Hampshire. Now, I'll be speaking a little bit today about the origins and early history of the Free State Project. So the Free State Project came out of an idea that I had uh, while contemplating the miserable state of libertarian politics on the national stage following the 2000 election, and while studying for my PhD in political science. Even though libertarianism and its philosophical ancestor, classical liberalism, have produced great thinkers, scholars, writers, and orators such as Adam Smith, David Ricardo, Frederick Douglass, John Stuart Mill, H.L. Mencken, F.A. Hayek, Milton and Friedman, and Robert Nozick, they have failed to persuade any part of the world to implement their ideas consistently. We can point to countries such as the Netherlands, Switzerland, Hong Kong, uh, New Zealand, and Singapore as having certain parts of libertarian ideas on certain dimensions, but we don't have any place that brings all the best elements of those societies, policies, and institutions together. Our message in the United States is drowned out by the lobbyists, politicians, and parties in DC. So could libertarians make a difference by concentrating en masse in a particular place? There had already been several failed libertarian nation efforts aimed at colonizing uninhabited islands or building platforms in international waters. But what about finding an American state that was already relatively friendly to our ideas? My idea was that we could have influence far beyond our mere votes if we actually promoted our ideas supported friendly candidates, and in short, were activists, not just voters. There were tens of thousands of American libertarians, and they find it much easier to move to another state than another country. Moreover, my dissertation research suggested that most Western democracies were decentralizing power to their regions. Some important examples include the UK, Belgium, and Italy. Since the New Deal, the US has gone in the opposite direction toward more centralization of power. But if that international trend reflects a desire for citizens in rich democracies for greater local control, then we might start to see more decentralization in the US. We might, to see, we might see the state level become an important ambit for new policies. In July 2001, I submitted an essay to an online journal called The Libertarian Enterprise in which I proposed that 20,000 libertarians move to a single state um, where libertarians could work to create a majority in the legislature, pass libertarian reforms, and work for more autonomy from the federal government. I asked those who were interested in the idea to contact me. Uh, within two weeks, more than 200 people emailed me expressing interest. We put together a Yahoo club it still exists as a Yahoo group, um, and a website where we hammered out the details and conversations and with various polls that we ran on different elements of the idea. And then on September 1st, 2001, we presented our statement of intent. Every signer of the statement of intent 
agrees to move to the state chosen by the first 5,000 signers within five years after 20,000 have signed. And once there, exert the fullest practical effort toward the creation of a society in which the maximum role of government is protecting individuals' rights to life, liberty, and property. Uh, you are also allowed to opt out of particular states. Now, 10 days later, the September 11th attacks changed the mood of the country, and the Free State Project nearly withered on the vine. Then, in August 2002, the syndicated columnist Walter Williams wrote an article about us. I encourage people to join, uh, get us to move to Texas, and then secede from the Union. <laughs> <laughs> Although his uh, goals were a little different from ours, his article provided a nice fillip uh, to our signer count. It now looked as if we could get to 5,000 signatures in a year or two. We set up a committee that winnowed down the candidate states to 10. Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, Delaware, uh, North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, Wyoming, Idaho, and Alaska. At that point, we became a big story in all of those states. Uh, the media coverage helped drive us rapidly to 5,000 signatures. We made some serious mistakes in those days, I have to admit. Uh, we should have held the state vote when we were closer to 20,000 signers, enjoyed all that free media coverage up to that point. Um, we should have uh, sent out our ballots first class. We sent out the state ballots for the state vote third class. It took about three weeks for people to get their ballots. They were never forwarded uh, to people who moved. Um, because a few people were concerned about vote fraud, we required everybody to have their ballot notarized. So you had to go to a notary and show an ID and all that. Uh, yeah. I was 26. <laughs> <laughs> Despite all of that, we had about a 50% participation rate from our signers in the state vote. And one thing we did right was to allow voters to rank all the candidate states. Uh, we then picked the Condorcet winner, that is, the state that defeated every other state by an absolute majority of votes. You can think of it kind of like a round robin tournament. On October 1st, 2003, we held a press conference in New York City to announce that New Hampshire had won the state vote. The runner-up was Wyoming, which defeated every state but New Hampshire, and fell to New Hampshire by a vote of 57 to 43%. So, why did we choose New Hampshire? Along with the ballot, we sent out a pamphlet in which advocates of every one of those 10 states could make their case. Um, so I look back at the case for New Hampshire. The New Hampshire essay was actually written by local libertarians who had signed up with the Free State Project and were re recruiting people to come here. They wanted us to choose New Hampshire. Uh, so that was a little different. Some of the other states were written by free staters who didn't live in those states. Right? And that sent a bit of a signal that New Hampshire was welcoming. Um, the local free staters here in New Hampshire even recruited uh, then-Governor Craig Benson to sign up as a friend of the Free State Project. He welcomed us. He said he had a lot more in common with libertarians than any of his Republican colleagues. New Hampshire's combination of low taxes and social moderation is obviously attractive to libertarians. So are the legislative institutions with a citizen, virtually unpaid legislature. I see legislators in the room who can attest to that. It's, uh, it's a, a burden to serve, but uh, we, we greatly appreciate those who do. Uh, elections for all offices every two years, uh, and the lowest voter to legislator ratio in the world. The presidential primary, interestingly, played absolutely no role <laughs> in the essay in the ballot paper or in any of the conversations online that I could find about which state we should choose. In retrospect, of course, We've had an influence on that presidential primary, and we'll continue to do so. After the state vote, uh, we actually fell under 4,000 participants because about 20% of us had opted out of New Hampshire, which was similar to every other state. So we no longer got national media coverage, and it looked as if you know, maybe this wasn't going to happen. 
Uh, my wife also was diagnosed with bone cancer, and I stepped down as president. So it was a, it was a difficult time for the Free State Project. Um, but then something funny happened. People started moving to New Hampshire without waiting for the trigger date. Uh, you know, one thing I want to do here, just sort of spontaneously, how many of you here moved in 2004? Anyone here moved in 2004? We've got several who moved in 2004. How many of you moved in 2005? And how many of you here are early movers who have moved to the state? <laughs> and I believe we probably have some signers here who haven't moved but intend to move and have driven here from outside New Hampshire. Anyone here who fits that description? Uh, we've got a couple of Um, so what happened was we saw that this was working. Uh, we saw that we had to continue with this. In fact, um, in 2006, we had a, a free state project early mover who won election to the state house as a Democrat. And he's back here, Joel Winters, where he's just handing over. We knew we had to continue with this. And slowly, we started to see uh, the, a snowball rolling as more and more people started joining the Free State Project, started getting interested, our summer festival, the Porcupine Freedom Festival, all of a sudden, and I think it was 2008, all of a sudden we had 1,000 people there. And now we're getting close to 1,500 people coming to Porkfest every year. Um, what we've seen is that the Free State Project is working because it gives people hope. There are so many people around the United States who have thought, I can't do anything about politics, I can't do anything about the taxes and regulations and crimes that, that the politicians enact that I disagree with, uh, that burden my life or burden the lives of people I care about. Um, so I'm just going to drop out, and many Americans just do that. But the Free State Project provides an avenue toward a much freer society, and that's given people hope, that's given people optimism. You'll never see a more optimistic group of libertarians than you will in New Hampshire. <laughs> and with that, I'm going to hand it back to Matt, who will introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Jason. Um, the next speaker uh, probably doesn't need much of an introduction to this crowd, but Carla Gurik was, did I get that right? Nobody else pronounced right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is that better? There we go. I'll let her say it. So uh, the reason why her last name is so hard is because she was born in South Africa, and she moved to the U.S. after winning a green card in the lottery. Uh, she moved to New, to New Hampshire in 2008 as part of the Free State Project, and she organized Porkfest twice, one of the few, and uh, before becoming president of the Free State Project in 2011. Um, she's done a lot of activism since she was here outside of the Free State Project, including uh, being the plaintiff in a landmark uh, uh, First Circuit Court of Appeals case affirming the right, the First Amendment right, to film encounters with the police. <coughs> and And in uh, many other ways has been generally bleeding, sweating, and crying, um, <laughs> cajoling, inspiring, and doing lots of other things to um, push us forward for the last uh, five years um, to get to the point where we are today. So without further ado, please give a very warm welcome to Carla Jarica. <laughs> Thank you, that was a very nice introduction, and thank you guys all for being here today. Uh, let me move this a little bit. See, this is why I don't usually have written things, because it's harder. <laughs> um, so five years ago, when I uh, became president of the Free State Project, I had organized as um, Matt said. <laughs> all right, let's try this again. All right. 
Five years ago, when I became president of the Free State Project, after, after having organized uh, two Porcupine Freedom Festivals, which of course we all know is called Pork Fest, which has grown into one of the largest liberty gatherings in the world, and I'm pretty sure this year is going to be historic. Um, at that time, the signer counter stood at about 11,000. I calculated that all things being equal, if we just kind of puttered along, we would trigger the move and it would happen in 2018. And then with five years for everyone to move to New Hampshire, it would be 2023. Then I figured out that meant I would be in my 50s and I was like, oh hell no. <laughs> I wanted to see the, uh, the effects of our historic mass migration movement sooner. Um, you know, in our statement of intent, we have the words exerting the fullest practical effort. And so for me, it, it became an issue of exerting my fullest practical effort. What could I do, because we all believe in individualism, to help this project and move it forward. I knew based on my own actions and on the actions of other early movers that concentrating liberty activists in one state could work it could help turn the tide, and it did make a difference to expanding liberties in New Hampshire. So three years ago at Liberty Forum, because uh, you know people give me a microphone and I'll just say anything, I you know announced on a back you know we'd done some calculations on the back of an envelope, and I was like, I think we could do it sooner than that. So I'm just going to throw a date out there, and then we'll work towards that. So at Liberty Forum, uh, where of course uh, Edward Snowden will be headlining in a couple of weeks right here in this hotel, he will video conference in from Russia, and uh, Governor Benson, who Jason just men mentioned, will also be here during Liberty Forum. So if you don't have your tickets, get them soon. Um, you know, so I announced that if we could fundraise enough money to implement my strategic plan, we could trigger the move sooner. The union leader, the largest newspaper in New Hampshire, ran a front page article saying free staters told to set clock for 2015. So I was a month late that one time I took vacation, <laughs> but we did it. Today, I'm here to announce that the Free State Project has officially triggered the move and that participants need to come home. You have five years from today, February 3rd, 2016, to come help build the world's first intentional liberty community. intentional community sort of in the idea of a kibbutz or a commune, but a statewide community that's bound by the principles of liberty, which basically neatly can be summarized as live and let live. New Hampshire was selected as the destination for the Free State Project for many reasons. You can go find them online. There's also a great documentary that was made independently by Free Staters, 101 Reasons Why Liberty Lives in New Hampshire. That's free on YouTube, go check it out. Um, so in addition to New Hampshire obviously being a small population state with low taxes, there's no sales tax, there's no personal income tax, um, it also offers just a really attractive place to live, right? So we've got our cities, we've got rural, if you want to live off the grid, you can do that. There are mountains, we have a beautiful sea coast, rolling hills, the quaint New England towns, and some of the best private schools in the nation. New Hampshire consistently ranks as the best place in terms of quality of living, it actually beats Hawaii. That confuses me, <laughs> but it does. Um, and in a recent study, the Mises Institute actually identified New Hampshire as the wealthiest, develop wealthiest state in the developed world. It beats Luxembourg, Norway, and Switzerland. <laughs> As philosophical and physical pioneers hoping to create a more peaceful and prosperous society where human actions are based on voluntary exchanges, it is fitting that our movement was born on the internet. As Jason explained, his original essay was posted in 2001. 
This was years before Facebook even existed. And the idea immediately caught fire because people were looking for answers. What drove him to write the essay is also the reason we're all here, right? We were like, there's got to be a better solution. Like, there's got to be a solution. Um, so historically, most of our participants have signed up online. Um, you know, they would go to the website to get information. Our forums, you know, remember those things before Facebook. Um, you know, they would come and ask questions. So as the years progressed, online social media tools obviously became more sophisticated and our reach expanded. It's therefore also fitting that the end of the beginning should take place online. And that happened through targeted social media marketing. And Vince is here, and I just want to give him a quick shout out. Vince drove the first ads, and really, <laughs> this momentous occasion is really in his hands as well. So Vince, if you could stand up. Last fall, we've been using social media target, targeting tools to expand our audience, right? So for the Facebook marketing, for a while we did some A-B testing. Vince and I would have a weekly phone call and we'd be like, let's try this, you know? And uh, we found an ad that worked really well. It was very simple. It's two uh, silhouettes in a cartoon and the one person says, should the government? And the other one says, Nope. <laughs> and it was great because that spoke to our kind of people and I would say, you know, on the spectrum because we are a big tent, right? And so as long as you kind of subscribe to the idea that should government, nope, we want you here. So uh, we finished the A-B testing and then uh, we started doing just throwing money at it, right? And we ended up spending up to $500 a day on the ads. Um, this yielded a significant number of signers. These signers are vetted in the exact same way as anyone else who's ever signed up before. They provide an email address. Um, in more than 86% of cases, they also provide a physical mailing address, although it's, they're not required to do so. They get um, an email saying thanks for signing up, and then they get a welcome package in the mail. And you know we let them know how to con connect with the community. And of course, now are going to start highly encouraging everyone to move here. So from October 1st last year, we gained a record-breaking 2,539 signers. <laughs> about why, right? I've always held the opinion that if we got the concept of the Free State Project in front of more people, we could get more people to sign up. And I was right. Um, you know, people are looking for this solution. That said, of course, the Free State Project is also not everyone's cup of tea. Not everyone wants to live their principles. But there is a large number of people who are dissatisfied in this country. There was a poll up on Politico a couple of days ago where you know 71% of the respondents said they think the country is uh, dissatisfied with the way the, the direction of the country is going. 49% of those people said you know they're not happy with the federal government and 29% said they're angry at the government. Now, some people just want to sit around and complain or apparently vote for Trump. <laughs> Others are seeking solutions. They want to do something. And that's ultimately what the Free State Project's about. It's about action. Upping and moving to one place to concentrate principled people together to affect change. As our slogan says, liberty in our lifetime. Nearly 2,000 people made the move early. With just 10% of those 20,000 movers that we know are gonna come here, these people working as individuals have already expanded liberties in New Hampshire. Some run for office, more than 40 free staters over the past decade have been elected to the state house. 
These representatives have worked on issues like legalizing same-sex marriage, cutting the budget, expanding school choice, and passing life-saving drug reform legislation. Yes. I practiced that sentence. <laughs> Um, others bring and start businesses and create jobs. Many buy and uh, invest in real estate. Free staters have invested more than $30 million in real estate in New Hampshire. The, first, the world's first ATM Bitcoin was invented right here in Manchester by free staters. And many of our participants, as we know, are techies. So there really is a sort of startup culture, and I want to see more of that. Others, of course, practice civil disobedience to raise awareness about issues like drug prohibition and regulatory licensing, both things that dis disproportionately negatively affect the poor. Others, like me, fight back in the courts. In 2014, uh, I think everyone here by now knows, I prevailed in the case against the town of Weir, uh, where, you know, we it's a widely cited case now. I'm very proud of it. Um, it's important because uh, even though my camera was not functioning, the court decision says that that doesn't matter. So I highly encourage anyone, if you're ever in a situation where you're in a police encounter, even if you don't have your video set up, just take out your phone. It's a way to witness what is going on. It's a way to create a record for people. And we all know everyone's on better behavior when they know they're being watched. Um, the other cool thing, and, and this case, because it was a First Circuit case, you know, applies to most of New England as well as Puerto Rico. So it applies to millions of people who can now know that when they're in a police encounter, you know, film it and that'll be good. The other part I'm really proud of is that in that case, um, police officers can no longer claim qualified immunity. You know, their special get out of free card where they say, um, you know, for us, ignorance of the law is no excuse, but they are the enforcers of the law and they use ignorance of the law as an excuse. That's basically what qualified immunity is. So in that case, they said as it relates to someone filming police officers, the officers will no longer be able to claim qualified immunity and they can be held personally liable if they do arrest you for filming. Um, you can also learn more about this in my forthcoming book. <laughs> Um, there are many other examples of things people have done, and you know, I encourage the press that's here. You know, talk to the people. Everyone has a cool story. Everyone here is doing something interesting, and um, you know, will be available today and then also tonight at the press party. So you may be wondering what the future of the Free State Project looks like. We'll be unveiling a comprehensive plan about the next phase at Liberty Forum. Another teaser. <laughs> um, but I can tell you this. We'll continue to solicit signers. We will be reaching out to them. We'll be reaching out to all the new signers, of course, via email and mail, and we'll be calling them. Ultimately, we want 20,000 movers in the state. Now, I know there's a question everyone wants to ask, which is, how many will come? First, I want to say, 10% have already come, although they weren't obligated to do so. Second, it's difficult to speculate at this stage, but the goal remains 20,000 movers. And finally, I believe if we build it, they will come. As we continue to build on our early impressive successes here in the Granite State, the federal government will continue its brazen overreach whether it's its police state tactics, um, surveillance, police militarization, the unconstitutional wars that are taking the toll on millions of innocent people across the world, or them trying to get their grubby little paws on our internet. As more people awaken to this reality, more people will seek solutions which life in New Hampshire, as part of the Free State Project, offers. In the future, we will see 
the expansion of personal and economic liberties. People somehow seem to have this notion that freedom doesn't work or that it's scary or I don't really know what the issue is. But think about it this way. If autobahns work in Germany, why can't they work here? If pot legalization works in Amsterdam and Colorado, why can't it work here? If gambling works in Monaco, or if gambling's okay when the government does it with the lotto, then why can't it work here? If deregulated markets uh, keep Hong Kong competitive, why can't we see more of that here? If unfavorable tax burdens are forcing people to leave their states and move their businesses someplace, I have a suggestion. Let's welcome them to New Hampshire and build the Silicon Mill Yard here. <laughs> In 10 to 20 years, I know New Hampshire will stand as a wealthy, prosperous, autonomous example, a beacon of liberty for the rest of the world to emulate. The future of the free state is very, very bright. And I say, first New Hampshire, then the world. I just want to say thanks again to Carla. I, th I think that many of us will never fully understand or appreciate uh, how great a sacrifice she has made over the last several years to keep this uh, giant, crazy aircraft carrier of a, of a movement headed in the right direction. Um, it, it's really, uh, I've gotten a peek behind the scenes and it's really intense, it can be really intense, it can be really overwhelming. Um, we, we are all a bunch of people who like to be left alone and do our own thing and it can be really hard, <laughs> I've learned, started learning, but it can be really hard to get people to all start marching in the same direction, even for such a good cause. So can you please warm, well, uh, join me again and just really... to say thank you to the literally thousands and thousands of people who have also made all of this happen. Um, all of the activists, all of the signers, all of the movers, anyone who donated, anyone who attended any of our events or talked about us on social media or talked about us to your friends, your family, your neighbors, your colleagues, um, and all of the activists who have made significant sacrifices, some of them have even gone to jail, some of them have lost their lives. Um, we obviously could not all do this without each other, and so I would like to invite everyone to give a round of applause to all of you out there. Yeah. Thank you.